welcome back. Today we're talking with Regina Phelps and we're talking about shifting baselines. Regina, I know where you're going to go in the next little segment. So off okay, to I'm you on again. it. Yeah. I'm on it. So I guess the whole point of my conversation and this whole introduction is really that I think this is a fool's errand for us to be using ROI to measure the the important work we do every day. And that's the key thing is what we do is so important and we have to find a good measurement tool to actually help us tell that story more convincingly. And so what I'm asking all of my clients to do and certainly what I'm asking the industry as a whole to do is to stop and think about things differently and really ask the question, is there a better metric other than an ROI? So I call this a little bit of soul searching because really what I'm trying our industry to, uh, what I'm asking our industry to do is to find a good way to actually be able to demonstrate the value we provide every day because we provide tremendous value. Now, so again, you're thinking, well, you know, what's the definition about this whole thing? So how do we think about recovery differently? How do you deliver, you know, kind of uh, similar results or think about how you develop them differently? Or, you know, the world is changing. We need to have a better definition of what we do, which gets down to something about what I'm asking people to do is think differently. If you think about how we actually in an organization can both in, tie the dollars that are invested into organizational outcomes. So think about, these are all value statements. They're not ROI. Increased resiliency. How can you talk about the competitive advantage that your program delivers every day on? How can you talk about things like an effective staff training and planning processes? How can you think about a more, a more thoughtful business process and development and testing? That is another way of what we talking about what we do. And it's really focused on something that's not ROI. And this essentially is about value. And that's what I'm asking every one of my clients to do. And I'm really asking the industry as a whole to look at this concept of value versus return on investment. Now, there's actually a concept called value on investment. I did not invent this. Gartner did about 20 years ago. And what value on investment does is it looks at intangible assets that contribute to an organization's performance. So things that are not tangible, you can't tie them to a spreadsheet, but yet they have to do with increased knowledge, developments of processes, organizational structure, the ability to be able to collaborate effectively and validate processes. That's what we do, uh, which is not ROI. And so it's very intangible, but super important. And so I would like us to move towards a discussion of value versus return on investment. And so essentially what this means is that shifting this way is going to allow us to really talk about what we're doing and not tying it to this sort of dollar sense thing. Because what we do is that we provide the framework for both scoping and prioritizing and initiating continuity projects. What we do is we are all about resilience. And that is a huge issue. So we can tie that to skills and we can talk to customer satisfaction and competitive advantages and collaborative mm -hmm. training. We can do a ton of stuff, but it's changing the language. And that's what I think is really important. I'm so glad you're talking about this because I was having this conversation over the last couple of days with one client mm -hmm. who want to come up with metrics. And the first thing that came out of their mouth is, well, you know, we can put a checklist together and make sure that everybody has everything. And I just wanted to bang my head against the wall right off the bat. You know, BCP, yeah, check mark, you have one. Crisis management plan, check mark, you have one. Right. Yeah, that's how we can measure everything. And I went, no, no, oh, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. That's and not here you are doing. talking about what I was trying to get them to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like get away from that old style, mm -hmm. traditional, outdated way of thinking. Right. And, uh, I'm, I'm, it, it, I'm pushing not. them towards some of the things you just mentioned. Yep. Funny enough, because they yeah. are in the enterprise risk registry. Mm -hmm. I said, tie that because where does that registry go? And they said, well, that goes to the board of directors and the executives. I said, that's what we have to tie to. Right. Right. Yes. It's not, you know, it is not checking a box. I mean, anybody that wants to hire us to do an exercise, for example, because they want to check the box, it's like, no, 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 find somebody else. Cause I am not a, box checker <laughs> <laughs> right 
I what I do is I deliver on value. <clears throat> and that's and that's a totally different conversation. And this is something that I think we need to really look at. So when you look at VOI, again, these are intangible, right? They're not tangible, they're not like dollars and cents, but they are incredibly important. And what they do is that a VOI approach, I argue, will encourage funding and participation in continuity activities and also lead to the success of them. And that's what we need to look at. So we, by the way, we are not alone in the struggle trying to describe these intangible things that we do. And this is just a list of some of the organizations that actually have the same problem. Things like health services, higher ed, technology, associations. I mean, you know, you belong to an association, you can say, well, gosh, they great, give me great value. They don't give you ROI. They give you great value of connections and building information and making, you know, networks and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. But they don't give you ROI. So how, what's the selling proposition for an association? It's about the value of the experience, the value of attending, knowing people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just us that struggle with this. And so what I ask my clients to think about is to really answer essentially three basic questions. What is your program doing right now? that provides value. And then what should that BCM program be doing that, that provides value that's not doing right now? And then the ultimate question is, what do we do every single day that provides a value to the organization? So when the executive asks you in the elevator, you know, what do you do here? You should not be saying things like, well, wow, when the bad things happen, you'll be really glad I'm here because <laughs> then they're gonna ask you, when was the last time that happened, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a bad, that's a bad answer. So the idea is that you should be able to just in a elevator speech, say exactly the value that you provide. And that's really what I want to raise in our uh, discussion here today. And so what I always tell people is, this is my suggestion to all of us in this industry, is develop a whiteboard session with your team. Now you may say, Regina, I'm a BCM person of one. Well, okay, maybe you have other individuals in your company that you could get together with, folks like audit or key uh, business units that you work with, or for that mm. matter, other colleagues that you could begin to brainstorm about, well, what, what is the value of BCM and what do we provide on a regular basis? And I think that is an important question to peel back and it's worth having a whiteboard session. And for me, what that means is that I always, I've done these with clients. You set up goals for the whiteboard session. You develop kind of a timeline and you make everybody who's coming to the whiteboard session, uh, give them a homework assignment. They ask you to think, well, what value does this program bring? And then when you get together, you want to make sure you've created a great environment for success. I've done a lot of these on Zoom. I've done them also back in the old days when we'd be in a room together. And then you want to really sketch out every single idea about what kind of value do you bring? And they're going to all have a different way of looking at this than you. And that's the big plus of mm -hmm. having a lot of brains in a room, right? And especially, you know, you may say, well, gosh, uh, well, who, who would I invite if I'm a one-person shop? I'd invite somebody out of audit. I might invite somebody out of legal. I might invite some key um, uh, business units that I do business continuity planning with. So some of the key lines of business. Uh, and maybe other folks like maybe um, HR or communications and just have a conversation about what is what is resiliency? What does continuity management bring to the party at our organization and really begin to peel it back? Because I think that's where you're going to get a lot of good ideas that you might not have thought of. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I want to give <laughs> our. I want to give our audience essentially eight things to think about. These are these are eight things to start with that I'm just going to give you that probably you could check a box for every one of these. I'm I'm pretty much guessing. And these are things that I I've, I've used to jumpstart conversations with my clients in trying to get them to really focus on the issue of value. And so as you go around the circle, you'll see things as obviously contractual obligations and compliance, competitive advantage, brand and reputation protection, risk identification, operational improvement, knowledge capture, increased robustness, and deeper knowledge. And what I want to do just is, is, um, is just quickly go through these as a, as a way that uh, you can begin to think about these things differently. So first of all, regulatory and contractual uh, compliance. Now, many organizations have requirements of which they must, either from a regulatory or some sort of compliance standard, actually have a BCM program. 
Uh, here in the States, uh, FFIEC has, uh, for example, Appendix J, which is about outsourced uh, technology or outsourced third-party services. If you're a third-party mm -hmm. service and you provide services to a bank in the United States, you must prove that you have a continuity program. So therefore, you're meeting a contractual obligation that you're held to with this customer. But it's also could be other kinds of organizations where you have SLAs. And so the SLA says that you have to respond in certain timeframes, you have to provide services or be on site in certain obligations. Your continuity program is going to help ensure that you're able to meet an SLA. And even if you're not required by any contractual or regulatory obligations, you might be trying to do something such as meet the standards of 22301 the ISO standard. Now, most of my clients are not ISO certified, but they actually meet the requirements, but they've not gone through the certification progress uh, pro process. But that's something that they can point to and say, our continuity program meets, not, not, not certified, but meets the standards of ISO 22301. So regulatory and contractual compliance is a huge selling point for your uh, client relations. Mm -hmm. Are you... Do you have any of those obligations in places that you've been working? Yes. Uh, one of the clients I'm with right now uh, is uh, heading towards meeting the requirements and then um, is looking beyond that to potentially get full certification in a few years down the road. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, everything you're reading, I'm I'm picturing myself in these meetings right now. <laughs> good, good. I'm, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um Secondly, I think it's a huge competitive advantage. And so for your sales team, or depending on what kind of business that you're in, it allows your organization to point to any new customer or new potential customer and say, look at this program that we have. We have all of these things in place. That means that if something happens to us, we are going to be able to meet our contractual obligations to you. And we are a reliable partner. Every organization wants to have a relationship with another organization of which they know that they're going to be able to provide the services that are in their agreements. And especially, I think, with so much outsourcing that you're seeing around the world, uh, you want to know that those people are going to be there. And so organizations prefer to work with a business who has the ability to deliver products and services as agreed to regardless of what's going on, right? A power outage, a hurricane, whatever it might be. So having a compre comprehensive BCM, including all the things we would expect, you know, IT recovery, business continuity, crisis management, crisis communication, supply chain issues, that's going to make sure that our customers are comfortable and it gives us a competitive advantage because other people, your competitors, may not have mm -hmm. the same type of program. So it's a huge selling point. It's, of course, huge for protecting your brand and reputation. And I will tell you, in all of my years of practice, every CEO I've ever met, ever talked to, one of the reasons that they want something like an effective BCM program is, frankly, what they lose sleep on at night is an, a damage to the, either the rep or brand of the organization. We all know that in some industries, once it's damaged, it's really hard to get back. And there are certain industries that you are dead in the water, like things like insurance or banking or finance mm -hmm. or investments. Yeah. Because if you have a bad thing happen and you fail, then your customers are going to go like, whoa, okay, not doing that again. And so from a brand and rep perspective, it's a huge benefit. And also, if the bad thing happens, you have a much better story to tell because you have a process and a plan versus one that has no nothing or, 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 or an immature plan at all. And so I think that's a huge advantage that we need to be thinking about. It's interesting you just mentioned that one because I had someone a few weeks ago tell me that their number one priority because of the way things are in the world was mm -hmm. protect the brand and reputation. So I said, well, what does that look like? What do you need? Mm -hmm. They said, well, we got to have BCP. We got to make sure we have this, that, and the other thing and protect our people. And I said, so shouldn't those all come before brand reputation? Because if you don't have any of that, right. you're you not have protecting no your brand. And right. reputation. It's very and true. They went, oh yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to have a rep and brand issue when you don't have any people or you don't have any technology or you don't have a place that you can work or recover or any of those things, right? Yeah. 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 But yet I will tell you it's the number one thing an executive thinks about. And they don't think about 
to your point, they don't think about what goes behind that, right? What yeah. what gets you to the point where you can have a secure brand and reputation? And certainly I will tell you, and we've talked about this a lot in the cyberspace when we've had cyber conversations, that what drives most executives to be deeply concerned about things such as ransomware is the impact of the brand and reputation. And that goes back to, again, an effective continuity program. Uh, one of the things that we do very well as professionals is that we are very good at risk identification. And because of that, that means that we can actually get ahead of the game, right? So that means that we actually can do risk assessments. We can look at the risk assessments, look at the facilities, the personnel, the technology, and make sure that based on the risk assessment, doing your hazard risk analysis, that we have the proper mitigations in place in order for that location, that part of the business to be able to stay functional when something happens in that risk profile. So our risk evaluation is extremely important and it gives us great opportunities to do lots of stuff in advance. You know, so whether you're, you're in a place where that might have flooding or hurricanes, well, gosh, you know, if your data center is in the basement or your data center has servers that are in a really low part of a building, you know, that might be something you want might change or you might want to move those to a higher ground, to another floor, just, you know, common sense stuff, but super important, right? And that's what we do a lot of, right? And again, that allows us that once we actually have the information based on the risk assessment, then you can make proper decisions, proper funding uh, with the data and the awareness of what that risk, what it's actually done. So I think that's a huge benefit that we provide on a regular basis. One of my favorites actually is really operational improvement. And I see this in a lot of organizations when they really dig deep in a business continuity plan. And so you get a lot of awareness from an exercise, in particular, a really well-designed exercise will do the most for operational improvement than probably anything. You can actually write a business continuity plan as many of us have over the years, of course, kind of in a vacuum, right? You're, you're writing it you know, kind of in a nice office with the lights are all on, everything's good. And it's hard to really imagine what it would be like when the bad thing happens. But if you have a really great exercise and you put people through that kind of misery of being able to see what would actually happen, you can actually get incredible operational improvements because then they go like, oh my gosh, you know, I thought that was going to work, but it would never work. And then you can actually begin to really improve things uh, accordingly. So the whole concept of planning uh, is going to really create opportunities that's going to really provide operational improvements. I see that in particular when we do cyber exercises. <clears throat> Pardon me. And there's three things that I call out in every cyber exercise that we do that can lead to profound operational improvements. And the first one has to do with the issue of, if you look at a business continuity plan, is there anything there for sustained technology outage, meaning exceeding the RTOs? Right. And uh, overwhelmingly, I would tell you, until I started bugging our clients, I've never seen that ever. Like, what do you do when you don't meet your RTO? Well, I don't know. I never thought about it. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, you haven't. So an operational improvement is what do you do if you don't get your technology back? What are some of the options? What are the workarounds so that you're not sitting there with a blank piece of paper during a ransomware attack trying to figure out how do you continue the business when you have nothing? Mm -hmm. That is a huge issue. The second is, what do you do if you've lost data? So I don't know. And if, do any of your plans have that? What would you do if you actually lost data? Uh, if there was a ransomware attack and they went back to their backup and you lost three days of data? Um, there are some contingencies that I've written over the years. <clears throat> and I'm actually writing them into uh, a current BCP right now. Very good. And it's uh, um, you identify <clears throat> you, some of the things you can do is contact who you would have been sending files to over the last few days to find out what they did receive, what they should have received, and getting them to give you copies of that mm -hmm. and send uh, things back so you can start rebuilding and cre uh, recreating. Um, that's one of the big things. You know, mm -hmm. is if you if you have if that's what you're doing with your data and sending it back and forth to different groups, find out who isn't impacted and try and get as much of that back so you can recreate where you were. Because mm -hmm. out of those three days you lost, you may only lose, ho hopefully, one day. Right. And, you right. Know, that's a lot better position than losing day. three days. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that's one way, you know, and mm -hmm. files that were in transmission, some things that was lost. Mm -hmm. um, 
or um, in, in some cases before things were even identified. Uh, there was one place uh, I did work with. They uh, used to always create with this one system a an emergency backup tape mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. if anything happened, a cyber aware, uh, yep. every night this tape was updated and it was separate from everything else so that mm-hmm. that way they could always send this one file that had to go because you mm-hmm. talked about regulatory and compliance yep, yep, issues. Yep. They could still send by courier or put it in someone's car and go and, and take it and deliver it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So um, they had they put that in place too, so that any event they would always still have something they could use, and that would be their latest set. Right. right now that and those are those are really important things, and 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 to really build on what you're saying is that when you actually are doing continuity planning, and you're really especially if you're working with employees that have been there a while. Uh, and they actually have maybe had some of these issues come up before, really taking and capturing that those previous learnings from long ago, even that actually be able to correct those. Many of my clients that are in finance will do snapshots throughout the day. They'll actually save those on uh, on on independent drives uh, that are, again, not part of a network, because, as you probably well know, one of the first actions of any person who's launching a ransomware attack is the first thing they do is they encrypt the backups. Mm -hmm. So the backups are encrypted. And then that means you have to go to a, you know, a quarantined off the network backup. And for some people, as you well know, that's days, days. I mean, I've done, I've done um, cyber exercises with really large financial institutions that would have lost a week of data. Like how do you make up a week of data? You know, you might be able yeah. to think about through email, but a lot of the transactions are just going on. Think of think of like uh, just processing uh, information. You would lose so much data. How could you make that up? How could you po- keep people whole? It'd be really tough. Right? Yeah. So I think there's a way of proving <clears throat> operational improvement. And especially when you're looking at how you're doing that operational improvement and you're tying it to really contemporary problems. So an executive would say like, oh, oh, I see now. If we had a ransomware attack, that means that we would be able to utilize these kinds of things in order to make sure that we were whole at the end. That's the kind of thing that really says, wow, you are providing us with tremendous value. Yes. Mm. That's when I know I'm like, yes, we're on it. This is a really important one as well, and that is the issue of knowledge capture. So, you know, I'm sure you've worked a lot of places where, you know, there's like one or two people that know everything, you know, like, (laughs) right? Yeah. Right? Right? And you think to yourself, my God, if that guy gets hit by a bus tonight on the way home, (laughs) we're in trouble, right? Yeah. (laughs) Right? So... And that also is happening in a different way right now, because in many places around the world, a lot of people who are boomers are retiring or people Mm -hmm. that left uh, because of the pandemic. And when they walked out the door, everything that was in their head walked away with them. And in many cases, that was a lot of information. And that's scary because those people not are only familiar with the technology of today, they know how to do that same job without that technology. Yes, yes. So it's not only the brain going out the door, but part of your contingency is right. going out the door. Right. And a great example of that was <clears> when <throat> I worked with central banks around the world, and they'll say, you know, you need to be able to do these processes manually. And they look at them like, no way. But then it's like, okay, who was back here? At, who worked here in 1975 or 1980 when we were still doing spreadsheets? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. That person, how do you capture that knowledge? Which I know sounds completely crazy when you think about it, but it's not, it's not at all. So this is really important. I think business continuity provides us a great way to capture information for critical processes. If we had to go back to, you know, square one because of a ransomware attack or any other kinds of interruptions, that's really important. Uh, last, um, last, or almost lastly, the issue of increased robustness, because you have an effective BCM program, you have strengthened the organization, prepared them for disruptions, but also you are also providing increased knowledge. Every time you do an exercise, every time you redo a plan, you are de- deepening the knowledge, you're increasing people's skills. That means that they can deal with common problems much more effectively, and it never gets big because you did a good job in that last exercise or your planning process was really good and people got much better and they prevented the bad thing from happening. You know, that's the best thing we could ever ask for. 
And that happens with some routine nature when you have a really good program. So we are robust in our response on a daily basis and we never go to the bad thing, which is great. And then lastly, I will tell you is that I think what I've experienced in all my years of practice is that when you have an effective planning process, when you've got really good exercises, you deepen the knowledge. And I'm looking for deeper knowledge in a team. And that means that I can improve processes, even day-to-day things. I can make them better because we have dug a little bit deeper. We understood how it worked. Maybe we're going to refine little things here and there, and then it's better. That's all good. That is all good. Now, those are the eight things I've mentioned up to this point. That has nothing to do with ROI. It's the value that you provide every day. And what we fail as a as a uh, profession is being able to articulate this in any meaningful way. And what we do is we struggle and we hem and haw, and then we fall on ROI, which is not what we do, to be honest. And we have five minutes left, believe it or not. I would believe that. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So my 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 point to everybody is this: is that I think that. Once you've actually looked at at what value you provide to the organization, then I think what you should be doing is really fully explore if there's anything else you should be doing as a program. You know, we've talked about all these things and hopefully you'll come up. I gave you eight. Hopefully you'll come up with eight more. And then the question is, is there anything we're not doing that we should be doing that would provide value? And then lastly, I want you to be able to articulate to me in about three sentences or less, what is the value you provide every single day? That is the biggest homework assignment I could give our audience today, because what we are, this is my favorite way of looking at us, because of who we are, what we do for a living, we are like octopuses. We know the entire organization. We are in and out at every place, because what do we do? We do all of these plans. We create these teams. We create the robust survival, recovery, resiliency of an organization. So therefore... We can break down silos because we know what so-and-so does, and maybe they don't know what the other guy does. We know that. Mm -hmm. They don't. We connect all the dots. We're involved with everybody. And so I ask our our constituents, our our fellow professionals to think like an octopus because that's what you are. You're everywhere in the organization. The only person else that's similar to you is audit. That's it. And you change. You have to change and adapt like an octopus does as well. You have to change and adapt the coloring and what's around you. Very good. I like that. So um, I guess what I want to say in closing is this, is that if you want to be successful, you need to demonstrate that you are a person of value. And so I want you to think about what are all the overt ways that you do that, uh, which could be things like preparedness months, uh, any kind of exercises and planning. And then I want you to think about covert marketing. I think I've talked with you about this before, but how can you demonstrate covertly uh, about what you're doing all the time, by sending articles to executives about things you know that they're interested in, promoting this kind of stuff kind of under the radar uh, and that people just think about it all the time. So what I, I would find add- that interesting. I did that just a little while ago. Yeah, I love and that. Because, uh, and uh, a lot of people, people say, don't send so-and-so things, you know, have it go through me. And I thought, well, no, because then I know it's never going there. So I right. sent it straight to this one person. And uh, he got back to me right away saying, well, this was interesting. Huh, I need to think that, about this. And the next thing I heard two days, two days later, it got back to me. He had asked somebody about a question and I was pulled into it too. And I thought, well, there we go. Now they're all aware. You told that me not to do marketing. that, but I did it. <laughs> I love that. That's covert marketing. Yeah. That's perfect. I guess what I would say to you is that this is the homework assignment I have in in the minute or two we have left, which is this. I think it's critically important that every one of your listeners, everybody in our profession do three things. Get your team together. And if you don't have a team, borrow people and have the whiteboard conversation that I talked about. Secondarily, get your elevator speech together. That's about a two sentence or less. You know, essentially, what what do you provide value in? And talk about that so you can do that in five floors of an elevator when your executive says, what are you doing in this organization? It had better not be when the bad thing happens, you'll be glad I'm here. You should be able to talk about a bunch of value statements right straight away. And then I would ask all of us in this profession, start spreading the news. Value on investment is the way we need to speak about the great values we provide every single day. And on that note, we've come to the end of our show. Regina, thank you so much. You were talking about things that I am actually dealing with with a client right now. 
Yay. So this is fantastic. And, you know, it was like, oh, I, yeah, that's, that's, I'm doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, oh, yeah, I was going to do it this way, but I like that way better. So, you know, this is, I, I really hope people paid attention to this. This was really good. I'm glad we finally, we, we, I'm glad we started with the end you know, today. <laughs> Actually, we'll we talk didn't about even, COVID next month. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even touch on it this week. <laughs> I know, I know. Yay. So thank you so much. This was really good. I, I really enjoyed this one. You're welcome. Well, I enjoyed them all. Always. Yeah, I enjoyed them all. This one is just happens to be exactly where I'm positioned right now. Timely. I like yeah, that. I like timely. being timely. Yes. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And to everybody watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.